Today, our focus will be on bodicilumab, next-generation anti-CTLA for immunotherapy. And today, we have an honor of welcoming Dr. Ryan Smith Lecter, a distinguished medical oncologist at Donna Farber Cancer Institute. This drug is a really important innovation because it took some of the things that we knew about checkpoint inhibitors and how they worked and how they failed, really, and tried to engineer out some of the mechanisms of failure and engineer in some of the mechanisms of success. How were you involved in this trial and what are your general comments on the results? Were they satisfactory to you? Early on in the experience, there was an observation that there was efficacy in colorectal cancer patients. And this generated a lot of excitement because to date, there really has not been um real efficacy of immune therapy in MSS colorectal cancer. Now we are changing the landscape into treating those patients with immunotherapy. How was the safety profile? Was it manageable? So the experience of patients day-to-day on botanilumab with balistilumab is actually quite positive. They have very, very few um, day-to-day toxicity the way you would have with chemotherapy. We could both prevent that toxicity, treat that toxicity, and keep, keep patients on trial long enough to drive substantial benefit. When enrolling in the phase patient, were you expecting these results to come? Yeah, I think this is a practice changing drug. I don't think there's really any question. Hello everyone and welcome to Onco Daily. Today we are discussing 10 one most promising cancer drugs in solid tumors which are not yet approved. And as we are discussing novel drugs with different perspectives, including development with the company, insights from the investigators, leading the trials and patient experiences. Today our focus will be on bodicilumab, next generation anti-CTLA for immunotherapy. And today we have an honor of welcoming Dr. Ryan Smith Lecter, a distinguished medical oncologist at Donna Farber Cancer Institute and an instructor in medicine in Harvard Medical School. Dr. Schlachter has experience of trading GI malignancies and uh, is one of the leading investigators in trials involving botanicilumab. I'm Amalia Sarkisana, medical oncologist and senior editor at Donco Daily. And Dr. Schlachter, hello, and thank you for accepting our interview invite. It's an honor to meet you here. Thank you for having me. So before we are wrapping up into the trial details, can you a little bit uh, explain us your role in uh, botanicilumab trials and a little bit on your background? Yeah, so I guess I can start with my background. Um, so I'm a GI oncologist. I didn't come to GI oncologist intentionally. You know, I thought I would be a breast cancer doctor, the lymphoma doctor. Um, I think... Um, and through exposure and fellowship, learned that GI is just a great place to be an oncologist. Um, a tremendous area of um, need and a lot of growth uh, needs to happen, and I think is beginning to happen. And um, for many years, I've had interest in immune therapy, and to be honest, um, had begun to lose faith in immune checkpoint blockade. And so this this drug is a really important innovation because it took some of the things that we knew about checkpoint inhibitors and how they worked and how they failed, really, and tried to engineer out some of the mechanisms of failure and engineer in some of the mechanisms of success. And um, and so the drug has really been impressive in data-driven, science-driven modifications of existing CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies to improve outcomes for what were previously called cold tumors. I don't know if cold is the right term or more like immune therapy-resistant tumors like colon cancer. Oh, thank you for sharing this and uh, congratulations on the recent publication in Nature and all of the investigators who are involved in the trial. Can you share us a little bit more on how were the results and uh, how were you involved in this trial and what are your general comments on the results? Were they satisfactory to you and were there something you prognosed? Yes, yeah, so we were one of the lead investigating sites at Dana-Farber with our colleagues at Beth Israel, um, City of Hope, among other institutions, uh, MD Anderson. It's a very large phase one clinical trial. The trial was launched as sort of a stage, standard phase one, trying to find the safety profile of botanicilumab, the sort of next generation multifunctional CTLA-4 inhibitor in combination with a conventional PD-1 antibody balistilumab. Um, and early on in the experience, there was an observation that there was efficacy in colorectal cancer patients. And this generated a lot of excitement because to date, there really has not been um, real efficacy of immune therapy in MSS colorectal cancer. Clearly MMRD, this is a great story of success, but in MSS colon cancer, the response has been rare and very moderate. And here we saw early on patients were developing benefit, but it wasn't all patients with colorectal cancer. There was also an observation that it was patients without active liver metastases who appeared to derive benefit. And stuff has been written about this before by many investigators, including our co-investigator, Dr. Faki. And we saw that 
this drug really did work with deep and profound responses and prolonged responses for patients with non-hepatic disease with advanced colorectal cancer. And while the majority of patients with colorectal cancer do have liver metastases, it's a significant minority that don't, maybe a quarter of patients. And when you account for the fact that this is an extremely common malignancy, um, helping a quarter of patients, patients with very refractory colorectal cancer with immune checkpoint blockade um, is really a practice changing finding if this bears fruit in phase three. So um, it was very um, exciting time to be involved in a new drug and a data-driven drug that's meant to overcome the limitations of existing CTLA-4 inhibitors. And yeah, it's great to have something new in colon cancer. We've had very few uh, new drugs and new classes of drugs in this disease and MS is colon cancer. Yes, indeed. It's uh, very interesting. As uh, traditionally, you were thinking that uh, this is a cold tumor and immunotherapy has no role. And now we're changing the landscape into treating those patients with immunotherapy. And you have also mentioned about the safety as a person who were directly working with patients, how you saw them experiencing it with was better or worse tolerated? And how was the safety profile? Was it manageable? Yeah, so immune therapy always has a different so safety profile than um, chemotherapy, and we have to be careful how we look at these safety profiles and how we talk about them, because chemotherapy is reliable and recurrent and relentless um, impact on patients in terms of the recurrent toxicity we all know, be it fatigue or you know, alopecia, which would be persistent or worsening neuropathy, it's cumulative, and the immune checkpoint inhibitors don't do that, and this drug doesn't do this. Um, there is the random events that happen on immune checkpoint blockade, and this drug has them. And so the experience of patients day to day on botanilumab with balistilumab is actually quite positive. They have very, very few um, day to day toxicity the way you would have with chemotherapy. It has a lot more in common with, say, ipilimumab and nivolumab or pembrolizumab or dervalumab and tremolimumab. But there are real differences in the toxicity profile of this compared to conventional immune checkpoint blockade. First of all, um, there's prominent itching like you see in a lot of checkpoint inhibitors. There's also sort of an early activation syndrome um, where patients have a febrile illness in the first few weeks, and that seems to go away after a few weeks. They respond very nicely to NSAIDs and occasionally require low dose steroids. The most prominent and interesting side effect or adverse event in this agent has been colitis, and a significant portion of patients had colitis. At higher doses of therapy, up to maybe 40% of patients would develop colitis. At more moderate doses, um, it's, it's a lower rate of colitis, maybe a quarter to a fifth, 20, 25% of patients will have immune-mediated immune colitis. The other learning experience in this trial was that early initiation of TNF inhibitors, so with infliximab, made a big difference in treating the colitis and preventing recurrence and keeping patients on drug long enough to derive benefit by taking a steroid-sparing approach to address the most common toxic event, which was immune-mediated diarrhea and colitis, significant at least, um, we could both prevent that toxicity, treat that toxicity, and keep, keep patients on trial long enough to derive substantial benefit. So I don't think that this is really that different than other immune checkpoint inhibitors. Maybe there's some slight different character like any new drug, but um, the experience for patients is really substantially easier than chemotherapy. And keep in mind, this is a very refractory population. So these are patients who had had multiple lines of therapy, five of you, oxaliplatin, arenitecan, monoclonal antibodies, either EGFR or VEGF, Lonsurf, regorafenib, even uh, frequentinib. So it's a very heavily pretreated population. And so for many of the patients, it was a very, very um, positive experience because the day-to-day -day quality of life on a drug like this is actually quite positive. And we were very good over time at managing the immune-related adverse events, in particular with early initiation of infliximab and related drugs. It sounds very impressive. And indeed, you mentioned that these were heavily pretreated population. So give me some uh, personal insights into this. You said they are heavily pretreated, already exhausted prior lines of treatments. How these patients were reacting to be involved in the trial, which eventually led some promising data? Were they different from those who are treated in the first line in the clinical trial settings? What is your experience in it? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always the challenge of phase one trials, where it's a very special population who gets on trials like this, because you have to be very, very fit. Now, keep in mind, the enrollment criteria for the trial was prior oxaliplatin, arenatecan, 5-FU, and a monoclonal antibodies appropriate. And that actually could be a second line treatment for colorectal cancer, because the efficacy of trifluridine, Lonserf, even with bevacizumab, and regorafenib and frequentinib is so very, very limited 
those are sort of marginally effective drugs and pretty toxic drugs, either hematologic toxicity or clinical toxicity, and their objective response rates are in the single digits. So this trial allowed patients to enroll after the, you know, the big three, five of you, platinum or ranitikin, which means some patients were receiving this even in the second line. And so that's a fitter population, I think a more day-to-day -day clinical population. Nobody was treated in the first line, so we can't comment on that, but we would speculate, and trials will be coming, of course, that that's a population that would do well. But um, there's a broad spectrum of patients here, both treated everywhere from second line after full Fox Erie, all the way to fourth or fifth line. And um, I think for fitter individuals, they tolerated it just fine. Frankly, even for less fit individuals, by and large, it was well tolerated, but clearly immune-related toxicity, colitis, and other such things. That is not benign in a less fit patient. And so you have to be very proactive to treat that. But again, patients did very well on this, even in the most refractory population. Yeah, and uh, as it is a phase one trial, so uh, you were among the first who was involved in this and tested it. And uh, when enrolling in the phase patient, were you expecting these results to come? Um, I'll be honest, I um, I entered this trial um, out of hope and out of faith in the co-investigators. I was not ex especially um, at first optimistic, and I quickly learned that the drug was was as good as it sounded. I think there was a lot of skepticism for, for botanstilumab and belstilumab because of the long history of failure with Ipi and Nevo and Derva and Tremi and every other attempt in colorectal cancer, that's MSS. Um, but the drug kind of proved itself in its efficacy profile and in the safety profile. So um, I think there was slow adoption of the trial, but now this has been a gigantic phase one trial across many diseases, not just colorectal cancer. Many hundreds of patients have received the combination and we've seen efficacy, not just in colon cancer, but the publications coming out in a variety of diseases. But as a GI oncologist, um, obviously colorectal cancer is important to me. And when you think about the burden of disease, colorectal cancer is now the leading cause of death, cancer-related death in adult men under the age of 50 and will surpass breast cancer by 2030. So there are many important diseases, but this is certainly a very common one. And having an immune checkpoint inhibitor available for those patients without active liver metastases, I think is really quite critical. So you do think that it is going to change the landscape of treatment of colorectal cancer in the nearest future? Yeah, I think this is a practice changing drug. I don't think there's really any question. Um, there are patients with deep and profound responses. There are complete responses. There's durable responses. It's a new drug. I can't tell you what the five-year survival is on this drug because it has not been around for five years. But I can say that for um, the non-liver non met population, for the responders, we have not met a survival endpoint because patients are still alive. So um, so I really do think this is a practice changing drug in a lot of ways. Importantly, it's an effective immune therapy in col MSS colon cancer, and we can't ignore that. It also emphasizes the absence or presence of liver metastases as a biomarker for response. And that will inform not just this trial, but many, many other immune therapy trials. As we think about enrollment in these trials and design of these trials, there's a couple things. Number one, we're trying to assess the efficacy of immune checkpoint blockade in these so-called cold tumors. We need to look at the organs. And number two, we urgently need to address how is it that liver metastases have a different resistance profile and then treat that, overcome it so that we can provide this drug not to the 20, 25% of patients without liver mets, but to the broad swath of colorectal cancer patients who are in desperate need of other therapies beyond chemotherapy. So you do think that maybe managing the river liver metastasis also can have more people to come into this population and be treated with this? Yeah, there's two ways to look at that. Number one is to find a drug that overcomes the resistance in the liver, or number two is to carefully study patients who've had treated liver metastases. In this trial, patients who had treated liver metastases were enrolled, although it's a small population, and they appear to derive benefit, but we need to study it prospectively. So I would not cavalierly start ablating things in the liver that would not otherwise be a candidate for ablation to put someone on a phase one trial. But at the same time, I think that we have to look closely at the possibility that that's the right thing for patients and study it prospectively. Yes, that's some studies that I believe will be upcoming. And yeah. as someone who in, involved in it and seen the results, how do you see the prognosis of the drug 
what do you think are, will be the next steps? Maybe to use in combination or come to the front line? You have partially addressed it, but just to wrap it up. Yeah, there's lots of great questions to address, right? Is this a frontline drug in combination with Fulfox and Bevacizumab? Is this a second line drug um, in place of Fulfiri? Is this a drug used at maintenance on 5-FU? You know, if you look at the checkpoint inhibitor data in mismatch repair deficient cancers, there's that early group where checkpoint blockade is inferior to chemotherapy. And then in the long run, that's where the benefit is derived. And so we have to be careful as we design these studies to account for the fact that not everyone's going to respond, and we want to be careful about that. We need to study ablation of liver metastases as opposed to um, as opposed to just ablating liver metastases, because it could be the issue is the liver, in which case by clearing the liver of disease, we can potentially give patients benefit. It could be the issue is the cancer, and the ability of the cancer to invade the liver confers resistance to the drug. We don't know that yet, so we need to be thoughtful about how we study this. I don't think that we should make assumptions just yet. Yeah, thank you for sharing your envision and how you see the future of the drug going on. And uh, just to wrap up, as someone who already been there and uh, as it is going to expand and more people will be involved in the research with botanicilumab, what would be your general advice to other medical oncologists when they are using botanicilumab? First of all, I'd say put patients on trial of this drug. We need to get through our phase three drug, uh, phase three trial. We need to get this drug approved because I really and truly believe this is a practice changing drug. So number one, for now, find the trials, open the trials, get people on this trial and every trial so we can get new drugs. Um, like any new drug, it's a learning curve and you have to read closely the protocols and the clinical experience and the information from the company. I think the critical lesson of this drug has been early initiation of therapy for immune-related adverse events because it's not just a CTLA-4 inhibitor. And the experience in the phase one and the design of the phase two and the phase three was early use of infliximab for immune-related colitis. That made a huge difference. So patients going on this drug need to be tested for things like TB prior to initiation of therapy so that you can comfortably use infliximab. And you need to be ready to treat um, immune related adverse events early, not to stop the drug, but actually to keep people on the drug. The goal of a steroid sparing approach is to keep patients on and give them time to benefit because immune therapy is not fast. And even when you see early progression on this drug, you have to remember that pseudo progression is very common with CTLA-4 inhibitors, especially this CTLA-4 inhibitor, this next generation CTLA-4 inhibitor. And so when a patient is doing well, but scan doesn't look so hot, you just keep going. And it takes a little bit of bravery a little bit of reassurance um, and just keep at it. And patients really do derive benefit. And by 16 weeks, it's usually pretty clear if they're benefiting or not, but you got to get those first two doses, um, you know, six weeks apart in and sometimes even the third dose um, at 18 weeks. Thank you for sharing these. Actually, it was very important because uh, we usually see how patients are happy with the results. And we also see the drug developers who are happy that the results are satisfactory. And we are missing the point where actually the one who are at the bad side and who are seeing the results first and who are dealing with the patients first are reacting to these drugs. And it's very important to see your perspective also. Thank you for your time and being with us today. And uh, it was very impressive and informative our talk. And uh, if you want to say last comments, feel free to say. No, thank you for having me. I, I, you know, thank you for featuring this this effort. This is a huge effort with the company of Genus, with their co-investigators, with Dr. Bullock, uh, co-first author, and Dr. Faki, and Dr. Simberidu, and Dr. Al Curry, our senior author. Um, this is a really, really huge effort in colon cancer and needed effort. And I'm glad we can report success. It's great to have something new and exciting in colon cancer. Yes, especially in the population where there is an unmet need, seeing the results is very promising and drives even more excitement to see how the future and what the future will bring to us. Thank you, Dr. Flechter, for being with us today and uh, uh, see you the next time, hopefully with the better results and uh, hopefully with the phase three trials. That's the plan. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.